details. <laughs> Good morning. Grace and peace to you in fullest measure. We are glad that you're here today. I have a few announcements. First, there is a congregational meeting on Zoom immediately following worship next Sunday. We will actually do this between the uh, Lord's Prayer and the Hymn of Sending. Um, and so the Lord's Prayer will have the congregational meeting, the Hymn of Sending, and then the benediction. So please plan to be with us during that time. We have a lot of other announcements in the Courier. If you have not yet subscribed to the Courier, I invite you to go to our website uh, and subscribe to the Courier. There you can find more announcements. Um, I don't think I have any other announcements except to please put your prayers of thanksgiving and your prayers of concern, your celebrations and joys, as well as your uh, prayers of concern in the chat so that I can um, put them in the prayers of the people. Let us worship God. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. God is calling through the whisper of the Spirit's deepest eyes, through the thrill of sudden beauties that can catch us by surprise, flash of lightning, crash of grace. Let us confess our sin, not only on our own behalf, but on behalf of people everywhere. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen.
friends, trust in the good news of God's grace. In Christ Jesus, we are forgiven. May the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Wonderful. Bear with me just a second. I've, I've uh, gone to using two screens, which seemed like a good idea at the time, but <laughs> uh, it also means I have to scroll down on one screen. Okay. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Saving God, source of our calling, your word is full of power and glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us so that we may receive your grace and live as your beloved children through Christ Jesus our Lord. And let God's people say, Amen. I'm going to reserve the Jonah reading um, for later on as I'll be preaching from both Jonah and Mark. So let us go ahead and uh, pray together Psalm 62. Uh, responsively. For God alone, my soul in stillness waits, for my hope comes from the Most High. God alone is my rock and my stronghold, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. And you alone is my deliverance, my mighty rock, my refuge. We trust in you at all times and pour our hearts out before you, for you are our refuge. Common folk are but a breath. Great persons are but a delusion. Placed on the scales, they go up together and are lighter than a breeze. Put no confidence in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. Do not set your heart on riches, even if they should increase. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God. And to you, O oh God, steadfast love, for you repay us according to our work. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
today. Do you know the story of Jonah? The story of Jonah can be found in the Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament. It's a really short book in the Bible, and if you don't know the story, you can ask someone to read it to you. I'm going to try to tell you the story very quickly. Jonah was an ordinary man, but God spoke to Jonah and asked Jonah to do something that Jonah didn't want to do. I'm sure this sounds familiar. Instead of doing what God asked, Jonah did the opposite. Jonah ran as far away from God as he could get. And he did this more than once. Finally, after Jonah was thrown overboard by some sailors and swallowed by a whale, and after he lived in the belly of the whale for three days, Jonah decided that maybe it would be better to just do what God asked him to do. This is called repentance or changing one's mind. Once Jonah was spit out by the whale, Jonah went and did what God asked him to do. You might think Jonah would be happy after that, but he wasn't. Even though he did what God told him to do, he was still mad. You see, God didn't do what Jonah wanted him to do. Please ask your grown up to read you this story. It's a good one. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for loving us even when we disobey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to go now to our Old Testament lesson, which should sound somewhat familiar to you after the children's sermon. Before I start to read the scripture, I'm going to ask Jen... You must close your ears for a moment. Don't really, though, because then you won't know when to come back. Remember when you had Shakespeare in high school and the teacher told you to read the approved version, but instead you looked everywhere for the version with annotations? The ones that explained Shakespearean English to ordinary Americans? I'm going to read the scriptures to you like that, with annotations, those annotations you looked so hard to find in high school. Okay, Jen, you can open your ears now. From the third chapter of the book of Jonah, the word of Yahweh, that is God or the Lord, came to Jonah a second time saying, get up go to Nineveh. Nineveh. Nineveh was the biggest city in the biggest empire in Assyria, which was the biggest empire. 
that is the biggest empire in the sixth century BCE before common era. Asking a Hebrew to go to Nineveh in Jonah's time was like, like asking a Hebrew to go to Berlin during the Second World War. So God says to Jonah, get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of Yahweh. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's walk. And he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, overthrown is an ambiguous word in Hebrew, as are most words in Hebrew. Hapa can mean either to destroy or to be transformed. And the people of Nineveh <clears throat> believed God. They didn't believe Jonah, they believed God. Uh, they saw Jonah as the mouthpiece of God, which is what the word prophet means. The people of Nineveh proclaimed a fast and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. Fasting and what are sometimes called hair shirts or sackcloth. These are old, old, old spiritual practices, symbols of mourning and repentance. When God saw what the Ninevites did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed God's mind about the calamity that God had said God would bring upon them. And God did not do it. This is the word of the Lord, according to Jonah. And for our New Testament or gospel lesson, our Greek scripture lesson today, comes from the first chapter of the book of Mark, beginning with the 14th verse. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Continuing with the annotations, good news is a term that would have signaled to the reader that Jesus was in opposition to the Roman Empire. Because the very word that Mark uses, euangelion, is the same word that the Roman Empire used to announce the birth of an heir to the Roman emperor. So Jesus came, uh, announced, proclaiming the good news of God, saying, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe in this good news, euangelion, that is trust in this announcement of the birth of the rule of God. Just like Jonah, Jesus is heralding a change in ruler. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. And immediately they left their nets, that is their livelihood, the tools of their trade, and followed Jesus. As Jesus went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending their nets. Immediately, Jesus called them and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our good and gracious God. Amen. 
behavioral science has a new theory. It's called nudge theory. Here's an example. If you put fruit at eye level in the grocery store, that counts as a nudge toward healthy eating. On the other hand, if you ban all junk food from now until the end of time, you're not in accordance with nudge theory. Nudge theory has been used for everything from positive reward-based behavior modification, modification to clickbait. Those of you who wear a Fitbit really like those fireworks that go off when you reach 10,000 steps a day. Nudge theory works. We can debate about whether we are being nudged in a positive or a negative direction, but unless you are a nudge theory expert who can recognize all the ways that you are being nudged, you are subject to nudge theory's powers. Clearly, Jonah was not receptive to a nudge. God had to scare him to death almost before Jonah would do the work to which God had called him. There are a few of us out there in this category. God rarely makes God's self known quite so dramatically. And yet, in the beginning, despite the lack of ambiguity, Jonah ran in the opposite direction. As reluctant as Jonah is to be a prophet, he is undoubtedly the world's most effective prophet. No one has been able to turn a town around as quickly and completely as Jonah. Alas, success did not satisfy. Following God's call doesn't mean that we get what we want. Jonah wanted revenge, but God gave them mercy. Jonah was called to tell the Ninevites that their time as an empire was over. God had tired of their violent and evil ways. You might say that Jonah was called to speak truth to power in love. Although Jonah was light on the love part. In contrast, Simon, Andrew, James, and John responded to Jesus immediately and unambiguously, leaving their livelihood and their elders behind. Jesus calls, they respond. Yet Jonah's story and the disciples' story have more in common than we might see at first glance. In both stories, it took a while for God's message of transformation to take hold. And that's because transformation always happens on God's time, not our own. For Jonah, the lag came at the front end through Jonah's reluctance. And although Simon Peter responded immediately to Jesus' call, God's message through Peter was not immediately heard. Remember, Jesus rebuked Peter for seeking to claim power that did not belong to Peter. Remember Peter's denial before the cock crowed. Human actors, Jonah's or disciples are inherently imperfect Yet somehow God's message gets through. In Peter's case, his ministry in Rome after Jesus' death and his martyrdom there created in Rome a, an underlying structure of the way. This structure was so deeply rooted it could not be removed and by the fourth century, Yes, that's a long time to wait. The governance structures 
that Peter had advocated for as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, had become so prevalent in Rome and across its provinces that Constantine decided to adopt them in order to unify Constantine's empire. We can debate whether that was a good thing or not at some other time. These two stories give us two different ways to respond to God's call, but ultimately the call is the same and it persists to this day Turn from feeding the machine, the system of empire. Turn from the human grasp and work for the kingdom of love, the kingdom of emptying. Set the self to the side, work for the common good. Though the call is the same, these stories are examples of both bold and dramatic calls. And for most of us, this is completely outside of our experience. As 21st century folks, we make our way through a barrage of data, which sprays most of us with a fire hose. We are doing well. If we can actually pay attention to much of anything, to that which is objectively said, to that which we can physically hear, to that which is available to all in print. Listening, actually listening for God to our neighbor, to each other, to our own selves. True and actual listening is rather rare. Listening the way today's psalmist listens. When we hear God, we hear in a whisper. When God calls, it is through God's subtle nudge. I'll have to admit, for the Jonas among us, it might be more of a shove. God calls everybody to something. God calls everybody to participate in God's kingdom, God's rule, the rule of love. God calls all of us each to invite others to listen for God's call, to attend to God's nudges, to work for love. God nudges us, we nudge another. God calls everyone to repent of systems and practices that harm or oppress. To be faithful is to listen for God's call, those gentle nudges that suggest to us what God wants us to do. Sometimes, like Jonah, we hear God just fine, but we don't want to go out on a limb. Sometimes we follow, but are disappointed when God doesn't do what we want God to do. Sometimes, like Peter, we immediately follow, become sidetracked by human desires for power or for certainty or from our own cowardice. But in the end, we spread God's message in spite of ourselves. God causes all, calls us all to listen, to create a space in our lives where we can see through God's eyes the world around us, hear God whisper, feel God's nudge. Sometimes God nudges us so that we might nudge another. Some people call this witnessing. Some people call this evangelism. Some people call this one beggar telling another beggar where to get bread. So, nudge and be nudged. Don't run, don't hide. Know you are loved no matter what and that God is merciful. 
how is God nudging you now? Friends, it is my good pleasure to welcome into membership today my husband, John Newley, who is here. Um, John, you can wave your hand. We have so many with us today. Everybody might not be able to see John, but he's there. And um, we also have Jane Lindsay joining us. Jane, I think, is here too. Jane, wave your hand. Um, we want to welcome you into membership and invite you to say with us our affirmation of faith. Once we're back together, then we will we will do a better job of welcoming you and have you stand at the back of the sanctuary so at the end of worship so everyone can greet you. 
Let us pray together our affirmation of faith. Merciful God, we can, no, that's not right, sorry. I need a helper, I think. Affirmation, okay, here we go. God's sovereign love is a mystery beyond the reach of the human mind. Human thought ascribes to God superlatives of power, wisdom, and goodness. But God reveals divine love in Christ Jesus by showing power in the form of a servant, wisdom in the folly of the cross, and goodness in receiving sinful men and women. The power of God's love in Christ to transform the world discloses that the Redeemer is the Lord and creator who made all things to serve the purposes of God's love. There is only one Lord and God from whom all things come and for whom we live. Let us offer our lives to the Lord. Let us pray. We praise and thank you, Lord God, for the majesty of your work, the wisdom of your word, and the generosity of your grace. Let the gifts of our lives bear witness to your goodness and mercy, your faithfulness and justice, and your steadfast love for all. And let God's people say, Amen. Thank you for bearing with me. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. 
we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Merciful and gracious God, we pray to you saying, and now with the, for God alone, our souls in stillness wait. Truly, our hope is in you. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we pray this day for your church. We ask that you teach us to follow Jesus, to nudge people, showing each beggar where you, a beggar, we beggars have found your good news, nudging all to turn and trust in you for our hope is in you. For God alone, our soul in stillness waits. Surely our hope is in you, O oh God. Ever seeking your glory, we pray for the world. Send messengers reluctant or immediately responding messengers of truth and grace to condemn destructive ways and announce the power of your saving love for our hope is in you. And for God alone, our souls in stillness wait. Surely our hope is in God. Ever seeking your glory, we pray for our community and ask you to be present with us let Lubbock be a place of refuge and safety for all who are in danger or need. Surround us all with your steadfast love. For God alone, our souls in stillness wait. Surely our hope is in you. Ever seeking your glory, we pray for our loved ones. Help our brothers and sisters who are suffering. Give healing to those who are sick and comfort those who are mourning. Comfort those who continue to mourn despite our desire for them to stop. We praise you, gracious God, for the visitors who are with us in worship, for Terry and Ron Cheney's 40th anniversary, and we ask your special healing on Sandy's mother who has broken her leg. Gracious God, turn our mourning into dancing and change our sorrow into joy so that we may give you thanks and praise forever through Christ Jesus, the light of the world. For you alone, our souls and stillness wait. Truly, our hope is in you. And let God's people say, Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, we are bold to pray together the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forevermore. Amen.
pay attention to God's nudges. And when God nudges you to nudge someone else, do so graciously, placing fruit at eye level. Go now knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit surround you now and forevermore. Amen.